Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 348th episode... Ooh, we're getting up to a milestone. We are, and our 350th episode is going to be a doozy. Yes, <laughs> been working on it for weeks now. Still not quite done, but anyway. It's going to be Hadrosaur-tastic. Yes. But in this episode, we have Dinosaur of the Day, Orodromaeus, and a bunch of news, including a sort of redescription of Scutellosaurus based on a whole bunch of discoveries, and some of the first fossilized evidence of the tsunami after the Chicxulub impactor, which put me down a whole geological rabbit hole. <laughs> Erectodromeus burrow? Yes. And of course, I have another Erectodromeus burrow as a fun fact. But before we get into all of that, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week we have two new patrons. So a big, especially big new patron thank you to Danny Hermes and Fireblaze. They both joined recently and they're both helping us get to that 200 patron mark where we're going to do our YouTube live Q&A. Oh yeah, we're very close. We are. We're so close. And eight more patrons who have been patrons for a while now we want to thank are Remy Rodriguez, Kaylin, Ashley the Acrocanthosaurus, Lucas and Eli, Ben at Jurassic Site B, Bill Jago, Joaquin, and Vincentrosaurus. Nice. Thank you so much. Because of you, we're getting really close to that 200 patron milestone, and we're really excited. And of course, it's the reason we can keep this show going. So if you want to join our growing community and get access to a whole bunch of perks, including we will give you a shout out with whatever dinosaur name that you want, if you want to go that route, <laughs> <laughs> then check out our page at patreon.com slash I know dino. So jumping into the news, we've got that Skewtelosaurus paper. But first, I want to go on a quick rant, and that is that Skewtelosaurus should really be the Arizona State Dinosaur. Oh, why is that? So several people suggested this back when Sonorosaurus was proposed, and that was like a lot of fanfare recently, like, oh, Sonorosaurus, Arizona has a state dinosaur now. But Sonorosaurus is garbage compared to Skewtelosaurus. Garbage. Complete garbage. Harsh word. <laughs> and this is not just because Skewtelosaurus is a Thyrea foran, and Thyrea forans are definitely cooler than sauropods. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> That sounds exactly like what you're saying here. <laughs> no, it's because there are over 70 Scutellosaurus individuals that are known from Arizona. It's sort of like how New Mexico picked Coelophysis because they have tons of specimens and they're largely only known from New Mexico, except that unlike Coelophysis, which is found to a lesser degree in other states, Scutellosaurus is only known from Arizona. Mm. All 70 of those individuals are only known from Arizona. Wow. And it's a super important dinosaur because it's the earliest known Thyrea foran. And so it shows us like the origins of this group. And it's really cool looking. Sonorosaurus is only known from a single fragmentary individual. And we don't even know what family it's in. <laughs> We're like it might be a brachiosaur. It might be some other kind of a like sauropod. Or it might not even be a valid genus at all. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Sonorosaurus, I think it was a terrible choice. Wow. People did point this out at the time, paleontologists, that it should have been Scutellosaurus and not Sonorosaurus. Counter argument. Sonorosaurus has a nice sounding name. Yeah, I think that's probably why it happened. And you've got the Sonora Desert. Uh, yeah, that's, that's such a bad reason. Second counter argument. It's a sauropod. <laughs> yeah, it is. That is a fact. Boom, it is a mic sauropod. <laughs> that's not a good reason, though. <laughs> I will say a state could theoretically change a state symbol. So all of these things are state symbols. Like you have the flowers, you have the state birds. There's usually a state tree and all sorts of different things going on in different states. Dinosaurs are just one of the many state symbols. But considering tons of states have really terrible choices for state birds, I think that it's unlikely. And <laughs> you can see our Discord for a discussion about the terrible state bird choices but there's this old post on the birdist.com about all of the terrible state bird choices and what the state birds actually should be, which I found really enjoyable. And the, the quote to summarize it is three robins, but no blue jay, seven cardinals, but no owls or hawks, five bleeping mockingbirds. <laughs> <laughs> and quote, but they didn't say bleeping. I just edited it because we're family friendly. Mm. And yeah, there are so many duplicates in this list. It's crazy because there are 10,000 species of birds and they couldn't find 50 different ones <laughs> like they only came up with like 35 it's crazy 
My personal favorite choice is that Utah's state bird is the California gull, which is a seagull to non-birders. They picked basically a seagull as their state bird. Mm -hmm. And it has California in the name, even though it's Utah, which (laughs) I find hilarious. But they actually do have a good reason for it. So there was this 1848 pseudo plague where crops were being eaten by tons of crickets, like a cricket horde invaded, Mm -hmm. essentially. And then thousands of these California gulls arrived and ate most of the crickets essentially preventing Utahns from starving and like a massive famine. So they oh, made them the state so bird. they saved everybody. They did. That's one of the few instances of <laughs> gulls being helpful, I would think. Well, they are voracious eaters. Sometimes that means snatching a hot dog out of your hand. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it means swooping in and eating all the crickets, saving your crops. <laughs> <laughs> there's no there's no ethics to this. Just whatever is easy food. Yeah. <laughs> Although a hot dog in my hand is not the easiest food to get. No, but the way you were holding it out, it was too tempting for the gull to resist. I guess. Never again. (laughs) As a random side fun fact, Alaska, California, and South Dakota permit hunting of their state birds, which is kind of funny. Huh. It's because they're basically all game birds. So it's a ptarmigan, a quail, and a pheasant, respectively. By the way, California state bird is a quail when it should obviously be the California condor. The fact that it's anything other than the California condor is completely ridiculous How to me. How many rants are you going to go on in this episode? <laughs> this is the last rant. Okay. <laughs> I just think, come on, we, we picked a quail. We have like the largest raptor in the U.S. and we went with a quail. Quail eggs are tasty. I suppose that's true. Speaking of hunting mm. the state bird. That's all the rant I want to go on. It should be Scutellosaurus as the state dinosaur of Arizona, and it should be the California condor (laughs) as the state avian dinosaur of California. I could just see this in future conversations if, and I wouldn't be surprised if state dinosaurs, like Arizona state dinosaur or California bird would come up in a conversation with you and you would (laughs) repeat this rant. (laughs) Yeah, it could be. I liked that there are a lot of other people that are outraged about the state symbols, especially state birds, because there are so many birders and they're like, what is this? Who cares about this bird? Plus, it's already in six other states. Like, why? Why do we not have this really unique bird to our state? Instead, we got this generic one that's all over the place. But anyway, back to Scutellosaurus. So Scutellosaurus is found in the Cayenta Formation. I think that's where Brian Eng was when we were interviewing him about that crazy story of extracting a bone. I think that was the Cayenta Formation, Hmm. but I'm not positive about that. It's named for the town Cayenta in the Navajo Nation in northeast Arizona. And the formation is from the very early Jurassic. Basically, it's like 196 to 180 something million years old. It averages about 190 million years old. But the earliest Scutellosaurus finds are way at the bottom of it, so the earliest end, and about 196 million years old, which makes it a super important dinosaur because it's only about 5 million years after the first known Ornithischians period, Hmm. and this is the branch of Thyreophora, so it's like really quickly Thyreophora split off, and we have Scutellosaurus, and we know a ton about it because we got 70 individuals. Should be the state dinosaur. (laughs) You said the rant was over. (laughs) Yeah, it did. (laughs) But... Since it's a basal thyreophoran, that means that it or something like it was the ancestor to later stegosaurs and ankylosaurs and every other thyreophoran. Mm -hmm. So it tells us a lot about the origins of the group. I get it. It's a very important dinosaur. (laughs) Yes, it is very important. (laughs) Not like sonorosaurus who cares about that thing. That one's great. (laughs) Rolls right off the tongue. It does. It is easier to say than scutellosaurus. But Scutellosaurus is really interesting because it's super small compared to its descendants. Scutellosaurus was only about 3.9 feet or 1.2 meters long and only weighed about 22 pounds or 10 kilograms. So it's like large cat, small dog sort of scale Mm. compared to something like an ankylosaur, which is basically bigger and heavier than almost everything on land these days. Right. Living tank versus (laughs) something maybe plated. Yeah, it's got it's got a lot of scutes on it. It's pretty cool. But even for its contemporaries, it was small. It's much smaller than the other early Thyreophoran, which is Scalidosaurus from the UK around the same time. That's like, those are basically the two early Thyreophorans we know about. But Scalidosaurus is quadrupedal. And that was one of those very early 
dinosaurs that was named in the mid 1800s by Richard Owen. I think it was it one of the original four dinosaurs. No, there's only three original. Iguanodon, Megalosaurus, Hylaeosaurus. Oh, Hylaeosaurus. That's the one I'm thinking of because that's also a Thyreophoran. Mm. Yeah. And we talk all about Hylaeosaurus in episode 240. We cover all the original dinosaurs, <laughs> but since that one is less talked about, felt the need to mention it. Yes. You had a Scutellosaurus dinosaur of the day. That's where I got that length and size estimate from. Mm. They're all super cool. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> one really interesting detail of overlap between Scalidosaurus and Scutellosaurus is that there are some Scalidosaurus like or maybe Scalidosaurus depending on who you ask osteoderms in the Kayenta formation which is really strange because we only know of the body of Scalidosaurus in the UK which is obviously very far away from Arizona <laughs> so it's possible that Scalidosaurus and Scutellosaurus lived together or at least that Scutellosaurus lived among some other animal that resembled Scalidosaurus. Hmm. And that's because it is so much bigger. I think it's like four times as long or so than Scutellosaurus that the osteoderms we find, we're pretty sure aren't from Scutellosaurus. We think they're from another Thyreophoran. So on to the new paper. It was written by Benjamin Breeden and others and published in the Royal Society Open Science, which means that it's open access. And that means you can go there and see the really cool paleo art that goes along with it. So with about 80 specimens of Scutellosaurus, I think I said 70 earlier, but this name's like 10 more and describes them, so we're up to about 80. It was due for a redescription since the original fossil didn't have part of the skull and it was missing a lot of the hips and some of those details. It was worth a full redescription. Mm -hmm. And they describe a couple of new individuals which fill in those gaps. They have the skull, especially the front of the skull that was missing, and then parts of the hips that weren't previously described. With it, they recreated its long, narrow snout. It might be more accurate given the ancestors to think of it as basically a typical early dinosaur snout, but covered with a bit of armor and with a beak on the front. Hmm. Other than that, though, it might look vaguely like a stegosaurus head. You know, that sort of long, skinny, a little bit triangular shape to it. Not at all like an ankylosaur, though, where it's like really broad right. and tanky. It doesn't have that look going on. More elongated than flat. Yeah, well, it depends on the ankylosaur because some of them are wider than they are long and other ones are a little bit longer, I suppose. It might be more like this one. Mm. They also elaborated their description on dozens of other individuals. Most of the known Scutellosaurus individuals are stored at the Texas Vertebrate Paleontology Collections and the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard. Fortunately for Arizonans, though, both the holotype and the most complete individual are stored at the Museum of Northern Arizona. Another reason it could be the state dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> almost every individual that was found, almost all 80 of them, were found with osteoderms. And that's because Scutellosaurus had at least 304 osteoderms. Wow. Also known as scutes, which is why it is Scutellosaurus. So it, it was armored. Yeah, it was like you could kind of think of it as heavily armored because it had so many osteoderms but they're not huge osteoderms mm -hmm. it's not like zool or ankylosaurus that have these massive plates on it right. they're more like i would say crocodile sort of size where they're just like little well that bumps probably along it. helps it move around because it was also bipedal versus the later ankylosaurs they're probably almost weighed down by all their armor yeah it's on <laughs> four legs it was more of a flight than a hunker down sort of adaptation to mm -hmm. defense definitely and it has long cursorial limbs and short front legs so yeah we're makes sense it's because it's an earlier dinosaur yes i shouldn't say front legs i should say arms because <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah it's definitely bipedal like you say like all early dinosaurs were the scutes start at the back of the head and they run all the way back to the tip of the tail so in that way it looks a little bit like a stegosaur because it's got basically these bumps going all the way down the back and it doesn't have a club obviously or anything like that at the end of the tail it just has some scutes back there. Interestingly, there are four different types of osteoderms on Scutellosaurus. There are some that are flat on the bottom, some that are concave on the bottom, some that are completely hollow essentially, and some that are keeled with a ridge running down the middle. Although some of those osteoderms actually have a pair of keels running down them, so they look really interesting. So that's like almost all the different types of osteoderms <laughs> yeah, we've talked about. I, 
I guess that kind of makes sense if it's an early ancestor and then maybe later ones got more specialized or something. Yeah, it is missing the ones that are a little bit more horn shaped. I didn't notice any of those, except for maybe the ones on the head might be a little bit pointier, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't have any really massive sort of display structure type osteoderms. These look a little more functional to my eye, at least. And those hollow ones sometimes are interpreted as being sort of like a calcium store that would hollow out depending on their nutritional needs. The researchers also did histology on several of the individuals, and they found that the bone is really poorly vascularized throughout the ontogeny, so as the animal is growing up, which means that it probably grew slowly throughout its entire life. Hmm. And it wasn't like most dinosaurs we see where they sort of grow quickly in the beginning to reach some sort of adult size, or like Tyrannosaurus where they grow slowly, but then they have a growth spurt. This one seems pretty steadily slow growth over time, which is really interesting. Yeah. And that would mean that if other dinosaurs evolved from Scutellosaurus, or if there are analogous slow-growing early Thyreophorans, that that faster growth evolved later. Because... We now can see the hips better, and we have more details about the overall body shape of Scutellosaurus. They were able to look at five different criteria that are used to determine if it is quadrupedal or bipedal. They didn't list what they were. It's a really long paper, but they didn't say like what the five things are. Hmm. They did mention that they could only score three of them based on the amount of the skeleton we have. So I guess we're still missing a little bit, even with all 80 specimens, we don't have enough to score it completely. But based on those three details, all three of them point to it being bipedal, and they call it the, quote, only definitive bipedal thyreophoran, end quote, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. They also call it an obligate biped, which means that it wasn't really capable of quadrupedal movement at all. If it was a facultative biped, that would mean that it's usually bipedal, and then it can be quadrupedal in certain situations. But as an obligate biped, that's more like us at least adult humans. Babies are obligate quadrupeds. (laughs) Maybe toddlers might be facultative bipeds. I don't know. (laughs) And then by adults, we're obligate bipeds. Like we, you don't see humans occasionally switching over to quadrupedal walking as adults. Only when they're not feeling well. Yes. (laughs) That's not really a a walk, more of a Mm. suffering move. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So I know one of the details they were looking at, at least, was the center of mass And one of the arguments that had been used in the past to say that Scutellosaurus was actually quadrupedal is that it was covered in armor. And so the theory was that with all this armor in front of the hips, it would have brought the center of mass forward compared to other similar bipedal dinosaurs. And that would have made them use their front limbs as an extra set of legs and be quadrupedal that way. But now that we have a better map of all 304 of these osteoderms throughout the body, and we know that they extended down the tail, what they found was that contrary to these prior estimates, the armor actually shifted its center of mass backwards towards the tail a little bit. So if anything, the armor on Scutellosaurus actually made it more bipedal (laughs) than Hmm. it did shifting it forward where it would be quadrupedal. Interesting. Yeah. So... As expected, they made some really cool paleo art of them being all bipedal. Yeah, and it's pretty cute. Yeah, and it is packed in osteoderms. Mm -hmm. It's completely covered. It is an awesome looking dinosaur. Should be the state dinosaur of Arizona. (laughs) I'm not letting it go. (laughs) I see that. It's just so cool. It's such an important dinosaur, too. We got the Sonorosaurus. I really like that name. Sonorosaurus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess. Also, sauropod. Yeah. Now, jumping ahead about 140 million years to the Chicxulub impact. (laughs) But it's still the dinosaur era. Yes. Well, this is that boundary where it is not the dinosaur era on the other side of it. Right. The end of the era. Yes. (laughs) We've got a paper from Earth and Planetary Science Letters by Gary Kinslanda and others. Hopefully I didn't butcher that too bad. It's all about the Chicxulub impact from 66 million years ago that wiped out the dinosaurs. It's also known as the Cretaceous-Paleogene boundary or the KPG boundary. Back in the day, it was the KT boundary for the Cretaceous-Tertiary boundary, but we don't talk about tertiary anymore. Paleogene is what people go with. First, a little bit of background about 
how the KPG boundary was discovered and how we decided that that was probably when dinosaurs went extinct, there were some early discoveries of fossilized fire, essentially. So like fire, wood, burnt wood in large quantities, as well as things that looked like floods that happened around the KPG boundary that were found in the early 20th century, which made people think maybe around this boundary, something crazy was happening on Earth that caused the extinction of dinosaurs. And then we had multiple theories about what that could be, whether it was volcanism, if it was the impactor, if there was some other sort of event that happened that wiped out the dinosaurs. But unfortunately, there wasn't a smoking gun for what caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. Some researchers, though, had noticed tektites and shocked quartz that seemed to be more abundant around the Gulf of Mexico. So there were some people thinking it looks like this might be sort of ground zero for whatever happened that happened Mm -hmm. (laughs) that wiped out the dinosaurs. And then everybody knows in 1980, the father-son Alvarez team published about a suspicious iridium layer all over the Earth right at the 65-million-year-old mark, now refined to 66-million-year-old mark, which might mark a impactor Mm -hmm. that hit at that time and then since impactors mainly meteorites or asteroids tend to be higher in iridium than earth is it spread the iridium all around the globe as dust when it vaporized when it hit wherever it hit because they didn't have an idea about where it was at the time and then we have that layer of iridium all over the place it wiped out the dinosaurs and when you look at the stratigraphy below that iridium line you see dinosaurs and when you go above it or more recent in time there's no more dinosaurs Mm -hmm. so that was their hypothesis fortunately for them the next year in 1981 the 120 mile or 200 kilometer in diameter chicxulub crater was presented by antonio camargo what timing yes (laughs) it's actually really interesting because i didn't realize this before but his work was based on gravity data collected in the 1940s for oil exploration. Camargo's? Yes. So he was looking at these old maps around the area and saw this ring and thought it was suspicious and looked more into it and then discovered that it was likely a crater and then presented on it. He wasn't allowed to share the actual data because it was owned by this oil company, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but he was allowed to share like the idea and some like low resolution images and some stuff like that. Mm. That must have been frustrating. Yeah, but I I mean, he still got to present it at a conference, and I think that was the main goal. But since then, we've other people have gone out there and explored and gotten more detailed maps, and we've even drilled into the crater itself, modeled the impact, and climate modeled the effect of the impact. So way more research has been done. Oh, yeah, we've seen detailed studies of, you know, what happens in the minutes and hours. We've talked about this on the show, and even within... I think within the like 24 hours of it hitting what yes. happened, depending on where you were in the world. Yeah, I think my personal favorite is a model in 2018 by Molly Range and others. And they showed the impactor hitting. It's sort of a 2D graphic of what happened around the impactor. And you see just like a chunk of the land goes missing like 20 kilometers deep. And then all this mud and earth gets flung out. And you see a mile plus high tsunami spreading out from the crater It's just nuts. And it also spread out lots of material because it gets rocked out all over the place. And in this new paper, they call that a boundary cocktail, which I I find really enjoyable. That's a fun name. Yeah. Or term. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's a fun word for like 600 feet or more of rock flying on top of you. Yeah. (laughs) So just it's just a cocktail. (laughs) (laughs) So this new paper focuses on the massive tsunami caused by the Chicxulub impactor. And the new site is about 800 miles or about 1,300 kilometers north-northwest of the center of the crater. Do you have any guess what is in that location? What's north of the crater? If you go 800 miles north of the Yucatan Peninsula, where are you? Oh, I see. Well, I read the headlines, so I already know. Okay. It's Louisiana. (laughs) Yeah. New Orleans. Well, no, not New Orleans. So it's almost exactly 600 miles from Chicxulub, Mexico, to New Orleans, Louisiana. This survey site is about another 200 miles to the northwest oh, okay. of New Orleans. And funny enough, it was also discovered as a survey for oil exploration. Mm. They're the ones with the deep pockets who fund a lot of these types of things. And honestly, a lot of paleontologists end up going into oil exploration sooner or later because that's where the money is and that's where their skills are useful. In this case, The site is at Lake Iat, I think it's pronounced, spelled I-A-T-T, 
and they use two-way travel time data. It's not gravity data. It's based on essentially what you might think of as ground-penetrating radar, but I think what they were actually using was a seismic survey, in other words, vibrations, basically like the tool in Jurassic Park, except that you don't use a shotgun shell and have a little CRT off to the side. (laughs) It's a little more complicated than that. Usually the way that seismic surveys work is you use compressed air if you're in an aquatic setting. So there's a boat and it makes really loud noises using compressed air into the water. They have to like get rid of all the marine animals or wait for marine animals to move away because it can be pretty disturbing to them. And then they have to stop if like a whale comes swimming by because they don't want to upset them. But they make these loud noises. The vibrations of those noises go through the water and then through the rock and then they bounce back up. And then behind the boat, they tow a whole bunch of waterproof microphones, which are called hydrophones. Hmm. And then depending on what kind of rock it hits and how much it gets slowed down, it'll hit different microphones at different timing. And then you can use a computer model to recreate what is bouncing off of way deep in the earth cool super yeah super cool technique and you can get really detailed information they can actually figure out there's almost certainly oil in this spot and then they don't have to just drill a whole bunch of holes all over the place and test that way they can be a little bit less invasive by using this technique when they're not in aquatic settings i watched a bunch of videos and explanations about how the seismic technology works because it's pretty interesting on land what they usually use is they have a big vibrating rig on a truck And then they just have microphones spaced out around it. So it's a little simpler. You don't have to worry about animals being upset. Although occasionally, apparently, they do use explosives. (laughs) I guess if they need a really big (laughs) vibration, they'll set some charges and blow those up and then measure the vibrations coming back. So I think they probably used a combination of these two techniques because the data that they have is about 11 kilometers by 11 kilometers or about seven miles by seven miles. Pretty large map that they put together and the lake is about seven miles long which matches one of those dimensions but it's only about half that in width even at the widest point so i think they probably had to survey a bunch of the land around the lake in order to get this full map so you may have seen the headlines about what they found what they found underground was called mega ripples at least that's what they're calling them Mm -hmm. (laughs) they're about one and a half kilometers or just under one mile below the surface of the earth and they run right along the KPG boundary, which is easily identified because there's this shift from a marl deposit to shale. Hmm. So there's a very different density. Yeah. So it's pretty easy to see. And it's been talked about before. There's other people who have researched this KPG boundary there, but they just didn't notice these mega ripples. The ripples are crazy. They're about 16 meters or 52 feet in height on average. And the authors say this makes them, quote, the largest ripples documented on Earth, end quote. Makes sense. Caused a very large extinction event. Yes. And it's just it's so interesting that that Cretaceous impactor sort of survived in all these ways, because a lot of times impacts don't last that long. They get eroded away by wind or, you know, it could be seafloor spreading, all sorts of things. There's a lot of reasons why 66 million years later, we might not be able to see all this evidence, but we keep finding little traces of it. It might be, like you said, though, so huge and relatively recent, geologically speaking, that it hasn't gone away yet. I should point out, though, they're not all 52 feet high. They range from five and a half to 27 meters or 18 to 89 feet. Well, 18 is still large, and but that range is very wide. Yeah. Yeah. And these are not like preserved versions of the waves themselves. These are what they say are, quote, compacted heights in what were uncompacted mass transport sediments at the time of ripple formation, end quote. Mm. So it's really just the dirt that got moved by the waves. So that means you're getting like 89 feet of dirt that were moved. And then this is after it's compacted, too. And a lot of times that's pretty loose. So it could have been 100, 200, 300. I don't know. They don't know how big it was before it compacted right. because that's not their area of expertise. Somebody else will probably study this, do some sort of experimental study and see how much it compacts under a lot of pressure. But you're talking about super massive waves that cause these sort of ripples. It's crazy. One of my big questions, too, was how do we know that this isn't just some artifact 
of the seismic data because a lot of times you do see ripples because it's waves after all. So you can get weird scattering that happens when you make these measurements. But they also drilled wells and confirmed what they saw in the seismic data. They actually drilled into some of these ripples just to confirm them. And they are, in fact, the size that they appear on the radar. So, yeah, they're there and they they look like they're caused by Chicxulub. One of the ways that we're pretty confident they were caused by Chicxulub is that the waves are almost exactly, or maybe they are exactly, perpendicular to the Chicxulub impactor. So if you draw the line from Chicxulub to Lake Eyot in Louisiana, you get like a perfect perpendicular to these mega ripples. So it looks like, yeah, that tsunami came straight from Chicxulub and left these ripples right in that pathway. They did give a proposed mechanism of the formation. They say that the Chicxulub impact caused about a magnitude 11 earthquake, oh, <laughs> which caused... That is hard to fathom what that feels like. Yes, it is nuts. It's bigger by far. I mean, about 10 times, maybe 100 times bigger than any earthquake ever felt by a human, because I think the largest we've ever felt is a 9 on Earth. Maybe there's a 10 somewhere, but each digit makes it 10 times stronger. So an 11 is nuts. It would have caused just innumerable landslides all over the place, both underwater and above water on land and just loosened lots of debris all over the place in general too just through liquefaction and all sorts of different processes and at the end of the cretaceous louisiana was completely underwater just like florida it's a very low-lying state about an hour later after that earthquake hit after all that debris was loosened up and sort of spread out all over the place the tsunami hit and then pushed all that debris all around so as these waves are going by we think that just kind of churned up the seafloor and then created these mega ripples. That's essentially the theory about where these mega ripples came from. Not necessarily that the tsunami carried all this debris in with them. It might have been the case, too. It might have brought in a lot of that debris. But even it doesn't necessarily have to to make these mega ripples. It could have just stirred up what was already there. But interestingly, the tsunami bounced around the Gulf of Mexico multiple times for days flowing over days. water and land yeah we've talked i think i talked about that before where like the whole earth was basically ringing mm -hmm. with just waves going all over the place Ugh. like nuts it's amazing anything survived yeah i mean if you're like deep in land basically if you're in antarctica or maybe like at the poles i think the ripples were the smallest mm -hmm. because the gulf of mexico especially would have been like a crazy like shouting in a tunnel you know it's just bouncing off all over the place basically ringing and then also going out to the west coast of Africa and a little bit to Europe. It must have been very confusing if you were an animal in that time, if you, especially if you're out in the poles. So you have no idea what happened or why these things are happening. I mean, I don't think any animal would know what's happening because everything that was within a couple hundred miles right. of Chicxulub would just got vaporized, essentially, or immediately buried by tons of debris. So everything else would be sort of I wonder confused. if you would have been able to see something in the sky and still be far enough away to survive. I mean, we talked about if you are you were in California, you would have seen that bright radiation and then it would have burst everything into flames. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, there's got to be some animals. A lot of animals did survive, mm -hmm. even though 99 point something percent of them died. You know, there were some number of them that survived, so they must have seen or heard something. But yeah, it would be crazy. But that could be why this is such a useful spot to measure, because even though we're 800 miles away and that seems like really far away and to get good data, if you're within two or 300 miles, you're not going to get any data other than crater mm -hmm. or just a bunch of stuff on top of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Death and destruction. Yeah. You have to get a little ways away so that it's not completely destroyed, but you don't want to get too far away. And fortunately, what they think is basically... The mega ripples are that leftover debris as the wave crested over where the Gulf of Mexico shallowed, which is present day central Louisiana. So it was deeper, like southern Louisiana. And then what's the present day Gulf was a lot deeper. And then as you get up into Louisiana, it started to shallow out and then the waves crest and then they leave all that debris because they're starting to mix up the ground a little bit. They estimate that the area was about 60 meters or about 200 feet deep at the time, <laughs> which is kind of crazy to think that like central Louisiana was 60 meters or 200 feet underwater, mm -hmm. which makes it deep enough to be disturbed by the huge tsunami wave, but not deep enough to be disturbed by later storm waves. Okay. Because as it's ringing, 
maybe you know the huge waves might have caused some ripples but they don't it doesn't look super chaotic they have a certain wavelength to them and they look fairly consistent it doesn't look like a totally nuts situation that you'd expect if there were just waves beating it up for so it's days. a little bit contained exactly and it's in that perfect spot where it's deep enough that the tsunami wave crested and left that debris and all that kind of stuff but not shallow enough that those later storm waves would have messed them up somehow or another eventually they got covered by paleogene sediment compacted and then turned into marl and then they're available for our modern researchers to find as mega ripples but again those mega ripples originally were even more mega <laughs> before they got compacted <laughs> Sounds like a scary time. Yes, it is crazy. As the authors put it, it is the, quote, first time such buried, geologically old tsunami mega ripples have been imaged, end quote. But we do have a modern example. We have good data from the 2011 Tohoku earthquake, which caused all of that devastation in Fukushima Ooh. and was super tragic. They were just talking about that at the Olympic ceremony mm -hmm. opening, and I think they said 18,000 people died or something so really lot. awful. Yeah. yeah, that's awful. I remember when that happened. From a scientific standpoint, the seafloor was mapped four years before the tsunami, and then they decided to go back again one month afterwards so that they could at least get some good data mm -hmm. from the tsunami. Maybe it would be helpful in future catastrophes or we might you never know what you're going to learn from these types of things mm -hmm. and you hope it could be useful in some way what they found in this case is that there were what they called at the time subaqueous dunes which look very similar to mega ripples you could probably call them like moderate sized ripples mm -hmm. by comparison they're about 1.8 meters or about six feet tall Ooh. but they have a very similar sort of structure and shape to them as the mega ripples which are a mile underneath central louisiana mm -hmm. That earthquake was a magnitude 9. The Chicxulub, again, is estimated at about an 11. So that means the Chicxulub earthquake would have been about 100 times the power. And that's why you've got the bigger ripples. Exactly. And then again, these got compacted, too. So it's hard to say how big they were originally. Mm -hmm. But the authors didn't try to guess at the size of the waves again. They were like, that's outside of our wheelhouse. This is, we can measure them. We can find them. We can drill into them and confirm their size, but we don't know what kind of waves would cause this sort of stuff. We need a tsunami expert to come in and sort of pick up the ball mm -hmm. and start going well, from That's there. the nice thing about science. You build on each other. Exactly, yeah. So that's the story of the mega ripples. Mega. <laughs> mega indeed. Yep. Moving on to other dinosaur news. In Kuji, Japan, there's a team that found fossils from multiple types of theropods, it was found in the Tamagawa formation of the Kuji group. And so far, they found more than 2,300 fossils. It's of a bunch of stuff. We've got turtles, crocodiles, and other vertebrates. The latest finds are from about 90 million years ago, and they're of teeth from three theropod species. So we, we have a bunch of turtles, but they haven't found the, the sauropod footprints yet? We're talking about theropods <laughs> with the turtles. Nothing about sauropods. No one mentioned sauropods here. <laughs> <laughs> so these theropod teeth, they're one centimeters to three centimeters long. So about an inch, plus or minus, mm -hmm. quarter inch, half inch. And they're hoping, the team's hoping to find more fossils to go along with the teeth, which would be good. But in the meantime, these fossils are on display at the Kuji Amber Museum from now until September 26th. Interesting. I didn't realize there was an amber museum in Japan. Yeah, me either. There's so many museums. There are. There's so many places to go. There's a lot of fossils, too. 2,300 fossils. Mm-hmm. I think that's why they're hopeful of finding more. Yeah. We've got more Dippy news. This one's just really quick. There's this fun time-lapse video of Dippy getting assembled at Norwich Cathedral. There's 292 bones, so a lot of people are involved. 292 replica bones. Yes. Because the real deal is at the Carnegie Museum. Right. Or also... Carnegie. <laughs> also, I think Dippy's a composite. Yeah, replica bones of a composite dinosaur. I didn't realize it was a composite. Mm -hmm. So it's multiple Diplodocus individuals combined for a more fancy, complete looking mount. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And this is the first time that Dippy has been inside a cathedral. <laughs> okay. Good for Dippy. <laughs> it looks pretty cool in the time lapse video. Yeah. It's a nice setting. 
It is. Those cathedrals are really cool. I know when we visited Europe, that was like the thing. You go to a town and it's like, check out the cathedral. And then if you combine cathedrals with dinosaurs, that's a win-win. There you go. So also in Norwich, we've been talking about it a lot lately. They got a lot of dinosaur stuff going on. I think they were the ones that called it the summer of dinosaurs. So that makes sense. This artist, Warren Ellsmore, has a Jurassic Lego exhibit on display from now until August 30th. It's called a Bricks Dino Exhibition, which includes over 500,000 Lego blocks and elements. That is a lot. So that's, is a Lego block uh, the same as a Lego brick? I think so. Okay. And then elements might be other Lego pieces that aren't bricks. Hmm. That's my guess. After watching the show Lego Masters. <laughs> <laughs> so this exhibit has a model of Mashikasaurus which is a small theropod found in Madagascar. It's similar in height to a human. It's made of 30,000 Lego bricks. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, that sounds about right. So that means there's probably quite a few dinosaurs among those 500,000 bricks. Yeah. Apparently it took four to five months to build these models. That was after the time it took to design them. That's not so bad. Yeah. It was unclear to me if it was four to five models for all of them or each. I don't know. Oh, gotcha. Depends how you build. Well, yeah, you got to build them brick by brick. Yeah. Although on the show that we watched, they build some amazing things with only eight or 10 hours. So yeah. I don't know. <laughs> That's true. And I think sometimes they do. They start out by like putting a whole bunch of bricks together mm-hmm. into sort of like units, almost like you're making an igloo. And you start with like a big chunk mm-hmm. and they put that in. I'm not sure how common that is, though. No, I don't know either. I am not good with the Legos. Lego. A plural of Legos is Lego. Oh. Or plural of Lego is Lego. I can't even do that. (laughs) See, that is how unskilled I am with the Lego. (laughs) Yeah. The Lego people, the Lego fans say you, the plural of Lego is Lego bricks. Okay. That's where you put the S. Got it. So this article about the exhibit also says that it pays homage to Dippy. I didn't see any pictures though, but it'd be really cool if there was a Lego version of Dippy. Yeah. Especially if it's life size. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. (laughs) That might be too much. That might be too much. You could use those clear bricks as the supports. Sometimes I've seen that Mm. they use those because you can't really have a tail as long as a sauropods out of maybe with the Technic. I don't know if they could (laughs) save enough structural rigidity to handle that. (laughs) Somebody's got to try it. Mm. So also in England, this is in Bedfordshire, the Zoological Society London ZSL Whipsnade Zoo has a new Zoasic Park. Oh, it's like Jurassic, but yep, with the zoo. Zoo-assic. Mm-hmm. Hmm. <laughs> you don't like that? Not really. Oh, I, I thought it was fun. So from now until September 5th, they've got animatronic dinosaurs around their 600-acre zoo, which uh, they said has more than 10,000 animals. That's a lot of animals. That is. I just realized it should have been Mesozoic or Mesozoic. Oh, that's probably happened in the past. It'd be better than Zoasic. So but Zoasic sounds like Zootastic and Jurassic. I don't know. But anyway, so the zookeepers, as part of this exhibit, they built a dinosaur nest with replica dinosaur eggs, and they put them on their squirrel monkey's island home for the monkeys to poke around. And there's pictures of them investigating. Apparently, they like to push them around and sometimes like take them off to the side to investigate. There actually are squirrel monkeys. Last time we were at the zoo, I was joking that a squirrel in the monkey exhibit was a squirrel monkey. And you were like, where? And I was like, there it is. And you're like, that's just a regular squirrel. Yeah. These don't look like squirrels. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) They look like monkeys to me. Cute little monkeys. So the zookeepers also put something with the penguins. They got a T-Rex footprint next to their pool. And there's some cute pictures of the penguins looking at the print and kind of poking at it and nudging stones around it. With the dinosaurs, with the dinosaurs. (laughs) And with the mammals. Yeah. Quick item about an inflatable T-Rex costume. We try not to bring these up too often because there's so many stories around this now. Literally every week there's something. Yeah. Yeah. But this one I thought was fun. It's in Malaysia. Kenny Sia got vaccinated wearing one of these costumes and posted this whole video online and said it was a guide to vaccination for dinosaurs. Mm. (laughs) So it shows the person in the T-Rex costume. They're going into the center. They say they're sanitizing their paws, which I guess that's not quite the word you should use but anyway (laughs) says they're also resisting the urge to eat humans and then resting after getting the shot and there's a lot of people who commented on this video about getting their vaccines wearing their own costumes (laughs) now (laughs) that's pretty good so it seems like it started a trend i remember in the early days of covid some people were wearing the costumes thinking it was like 
PPE to mm-hmm. like protect them. Mm-hmm. And then there are some experts that are like, nope, don't, no. the, there's a fan blows the air in that's not but actually protecting you. did bring smiles to people's faces. It did, yes. And our last bit of news, it's about Google Chrome's dinosaur game, which also comes up a lot in our show. <laughs> it does, yeah. They do some fun stuff, though. They do the fun stuff. So this one's got an Olympic theme going on now. So when you're playing, if you run into the torches, which sometimes come before or after the cacti, I played a lot of rounds to figure this out, mm-hmm. you get taken to a new area to compete in an Olympic event. I don't know if I found all of the events, but I got at least five, I want to say. There's one with the T-Rex swimming and the T-Rex wears goggles, and then when you press the space bar, instead of jumping, you swim under the obstacles. Yeah, that was cool. There's a T-Rex on a horse, and it's jumping over hurdles. That was, I liked that animation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the T-Rex sitting on the horse is pretty funny. Yeah. There's a T-Rex in running gear, jumping over hurdles. There's a T-Rex on a surfboard, jumping over rocks. I'm excited to see surfing at this Olympics, by the way. Oh, yeah. And then the last... This one was Gara's favorite. was a T-Rex in a leotard that was vaulting. Yeah. I'd say that was my best event. I got the furthest (laughs) in the game. Yeah. (laughs) It's fun because it does like a handspring every time. Mm -hmm. So it goes upside down for every jump. Because T-Rex did have pretty strong arms. Yeah. I don't know. They wouldn't have been able to vault probably. No. But they were were Mm strong-ish. They could bench press. Yeah. It gives them some credit, some credibility to their arm strength. And all of these games... When you finish or, you know, trip or something, they end with you getting a gold medal around the T-Rex neck. It's pretty fun. It is fun. And you made a nice TikTok of a a compilation of all of them, too. Mm -hmm. We'll put a link to that in our show notes. Sabrina's TikTok. I think it's better than the the article that you saw about it. Oh, I see. We also posted it on Patreon. (laughs) And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Orodromaeus, which was a request from PaleoMike716 via our Discord and Patreon. So thanks. And when he requested it, he said it was, quote, the Roadrunners of the Cretaceous. Oh, well then. Mm-hmm. They did have long legs. I think the Roadrunner is the state bird of New Mexico, if I remember right. <laughs> Here we go. That's a good one. I like that one. <laughs> good. <laughs> so Orodromaeus was an ornithopod that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Montana in the U.S. It was found in the Two Medicine Formation. It looks a lot like other ornithopods. It's got the small head, the long body and tail, and the long legs. It's estimated to be 8.2 feet or 2.5 meters long. Yeah, pretty small. Yeah, and it was bipedal, small, but fast. Extremely gracile and a fast runner, and that's based on its hind limb proportions. Got to be fast to outrun all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. Clomping around the two medicine formation. So Orodromaeus was found on the Egg Mountain site, which is the same site where Myasaura was found. And it was described in 1988 by Jack Horner and David Weishample. And they described embryonic dinosaur remains as well in 1988. They said, quote, we report here the first well-documented association of dinosaur eggs containing embryos, juveniles, and adults from the fossil record, end quote. So there were Orodromaeus embryos. Yeah. Jack Horner has done a lot of research on embryos, dinosaur embryos. There were way, I always, when I was a kid or when I first learned about Myasaura, I thought that was all that was at Egg Mountain, egg-wise. Yeah. But there's also Hippacrosaurus and now Orodromaeus and I think maybe even Troodon for all I know. <laughs> it's all sorts of eggs over there. It's a good place to start a family, I guess, that Egg Mountain. It's aptly named Egg Mountain. Mm-hmm. So the type species is Orodromaeus Michaelii. And the genus name means mountain runner, and it alludes to Egg Mountain as well as the state of Montana and to the animal's presumed cursorial habits. The species name is in honor of, quote, the late Robert McKellar for his many dinosaur discoveries, including the holotype. And the holotype is a nearly complete juvenile skeleton without the hands and tail. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. Usually if you miss the tail, it's not really the end of the world. Except for with ankylosaurs, where you want to know if there's a club at the end of it. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Most dinosaur tails are pretty similar. So the referred material of Orodromaeus includes the clutch of 19 eggs with embryos, hind legs, a couple skeletons, another skull, and a brain case. So that's six individuals plus that clutch of eggs. Wow. Yeah, it's a lot. And one individual is about 60% complete and smaller. It's probably a near hatchling. 
Another individual is more mature and has a crushed skull. And then another individual is also mature, but a fairly complete disarticulated skeleton. So they had a good picture of what this looked like. Yeah. Now, this clutch of 19 unhatched eggs with the embryonic skeletons was found with eggshell fragments from other nests containing young Myasaura. Now, in the paper, they said Orodromaeus was precocial after hatching. That means it was pretty active right after hatching. And that was after comparing nesting patterns and bone histology with Myasaura. There were teeth from the Judith River Formation that were originally referred to Thessalosaurus that was then referred to Orodromaeus by Galton in 1995. So even more specimens for Orodromaeus. But one specimen and some eggs from Egg Mountain are now considered to be troodontid, possibly Steinonychosaurus. Horner and Weishampel in 1996 thought that they were Truodon, and they published a correction in a letter to Nature and said, quote, further preparation of the embryo has revealed the identity to be that of the theropod dinosaur Truodon formosus. And that was based on the teeth. Then in 1997, Dave Vericchio and others described a partial adult Truodon skeleton with a clutch of at least five eggs that was probably in a brooding position. And then Van der Reest and Curry said that it was possible that Truodon was Stenonychosaurus. Yeah, that goes back and forth all the time, <laughs> whether fossils are troodon or whether they're stenonychosaurus, because some people think basically every troodon other than the holotype teeth are stenonychosaurus. So, yeah, I can see why that debate is happening. In 1999, Rodney Sheets wrote a thesis that I think was unpublished on the osteology of Orodromaeus. And according to Sheets, an alternate reason for so many young Orodromaeus carcasses in a Troodon nesting area may be because Troodon adults brought them in as prey for their young. Yeah, we've heard that kind of hypothesis before. Yeah, and it said that they would think there were more hind limb elements, quote, as the hindquarters of the animal would constitute the largest meat mass. <laughs> and the assessment found that to be true. Interesting. <laughs> but there's still been lots of Orodromaeus specimens found and Sheets' thesis said that he described material of 99 other specimens. That's a lot. I had to read that twice. So anyway, there's a second species of Orodromaeus, Orodromaeus minimus, but it's possibly not Orodromaeus. It's possibly Lausaurus minimus. Charles Gilmore described Lausaurus minimus in 1909 based on a partial left hind limb and pieces of vertebra found in Alberta, Canada in the Allison Formation. Oh, so they reclassified Lausaurus minimus to Orodromaeus, it sounds like? Yeah, there's a whole story. So we're talking about this second species, Lausaurus minimus, which might possibly be Orodromaeus minimus. And in 1949, Laurie's Russell published about how the specimen from the Allison formation... So the Lausaurus? Mm -hmm, ...was probably found in the Belly River group not in the Blairmore group. That was based on field work done in the early 1930s. So they published about it in 1949 and found that it was distinct from Lausaurus. And there are a couple different species of Lausaurus. But Lausaurus is kind of a dubious dinosaur. Anyway, Russell found this specimen to be most like Hypsilophodon, which lived in the early Cretaceous in what's now England. In the 1980s, Galton suggested that this specimen, Orodromaeus minimus, or Lausaurus minimus, was Troodon, but that was based on unpublished evidence. And then in 1990, Susan Norman found Lausaurus minimus to possibly beat Orodromaeus minimus, but there weren't enough fossils to be sure. But back to more general Orodromaeus, Horner and Weishampel said that Quote, tooth wear indicates reversion to or retention of the primitive high angle fabrosaur like <laughs> style of chewing. Fabrosaur? Yes. And the family Fabrosauridae is now considered to be basal ornithischia. Ornithischia. Uh -huh. So, based on a 2013 study by Jordan Mallon and others, a small ornithopod like Orodromaeus probably ate food that was at most about three feet or one meters high. Sheets said that the triangular teeth with the high angle of how the teeth fit together may show a shift to eating insects. Hmm. It's possible the teeth were that way in infants, and then the known Orodromaeus specimens were young, or the adults kept that neonate condition even as they grew. 
Orodromaeus had boss-like growths on its cheekbones. Zephyrosaurus may be closely related to Orodromaeus, and that's based on both of them having bosses on their cheeks, and we talked about that in episode 306. Orodromaeus may have burrowed, like Erichtodromaeus, based on how the fossils were found packed together in places where they usually would have been found scattered. So there's no clear evidence that it burrowed, but maybe. So it might have been in a burrow that fossilized, but we don't have good evidence of the burrow, Mm -hmm. it sounds like. In 2009, Jack Horner and others compared the histology and growth of Orodromaeus, Dryosaurus, and Tenontosaurus, and they looked at perinate, embryos or recently hatched specimens, juveniles, subadults, and adults. They said that a typical perinate had a femur length of 0.6 inches or 16 millimeters. Oh, yeah. so little. And then there were smaller and larger juveniles. The subadult femur was poorly preserved and destroyed by bacterial mycelial actions. And the adult tibia was also invaded by bacteria. But the adult femurs were 7 to 7.8 inches or 180 to 200 millimeters or greater in length. Still pretty small. A lot Mm -hmm. smaller than our femur, at least. Yeah. The Orodromaeus did reach a growth plateau. They found the first lag on the late juvenile specimens, and that's similar to Myasaura, but Myasaura is much bigger. They couldn't count the exact number of lags on the adult because it was too poorly preserved because of the bacteria, but they counted at least five lags in the better preserved individuals. So it's estimated that those later juveniles were three to four years old and that Orodromaeus reached adult size one to two years after that. Pretty quick. Mm-hmm. Although it's small, so <laughs> it's not too surprising that it could grow quickly to its maximum size. Yeah, exactly. So Orodromaeus, it's relatively small, but it still had considerable growth trajectory from embryo to adult. Not like Scutellosaurus, which grew slowly, even though it ended up small. Right. Orodromaeus grew quickly after hatching and then slowed down as a later juvenile. They said it probably grew faster than a crocodile, but not as fast as a bird. (laughs) It's hard to grow as fast as a bird. They're full size in less than a year in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. And our fun fact of the day is more about Scutellosaurus and why it should be the state dinosaur of Arizona. You said you were (laughs) done with that rant. I'm just kidding. That's not what it is. It's that ankylosaurs and other dinosaurs could have floated for weeks before finally sinking and fossilizing when going through the bloat and float mechanism. I see you opted not to ramp, but you did want to add more ankylosaurs. Yes. And since this fun fact is based on a crocodilian study and Scutellosaurus has sort of crocodilian-like scutes, it's sort of vaguely related, but... I'm going to get a bit descriptive about how some animals decayed. So if you're not interested in that sort of detail, you might want to skip this fun fact. It's a a little bit graphic at some times, but it's also super interesting and really informative about some of the dinosaurs that have fossilized. So I think it's worth covering. Do tell. Yes. So there was a presentation by Caitlin Syme, I think is how you pronounce it, at SVP in 2014. And she also published an associated paper or wrote an associated paper about eight dead saltwater crocodiles decomposing, a.k.a. a taphonomy experiment to us paleontology nerds. (laughs) So basically, there was another experiment which tested how diet affected the growth of saltwater crocodiles. And then at the end of that experiment, they euthanized the crocodiles to take measurements and look at the muscles and all sorts of bone growth and stuff like that. And so they had eight dead crocodiles left over frozen in a freezer somewhere. Hmm. What do you do with these crocodiles? Obviously, you throw them in some fish tanks and wash them decompose. (laughs) That's what you do. So they started with all of these eight dead crocodiles on the bottom of fish tanks they actually buried two of them they left the other six just in the bottom of the tank and half of those so three of the eight they intended to bury once they bloated and then sank so it was like two of them were going to be buried the entire time three of them were going to be not buried at all ever and the middle three were not buried in the beginning, but then once they sank, we're going to be buried. So that's sort of what we think might happen with some of the dinosaurs that fossilized. You know, they would bloat and float. And then once they sank, probably got buried quickly afterwards because they didn't get scavenged and go missing. Hmm. So in the beginning of the experiment, all eight of the crocodiles were at the bottom of the tanks. 
including two that were buried. Mm -hmm. After four days, the crocodiles were floating on the surface. And that actually includes one of the ones that was buried because one of the buried ones had enough bloat inside its body. It actually pushed up through the sand it was buried in and floated to the surface. I bet they smelled great. (laughs) Yes. And then what they had to do is they, they basically turned that one into like a hybrid between the first group that was buried the whole time and the one that got buried after it was bloated. So they buried it again a little bit later. But with the ones that were intended to be floating, after 10 days, they were still floating, but they were rapidly decomposing. And they emphasized that they continued floating well after they were very decayed with organs and bones exposed due to the rotting. Hmm. So it wasn't a simple balloon popping analogy that caused them to sink, which is how I always think about it. I think of it as these gases building up in the abdomen and then they're floating like a balloon on the surface of the water and then something pops it and then it sinks. But that is not at all what happened. In fact, all of the crocodiles came pre-popped because they had an incision on a leg from that previous experiment, which actually was an escape route for the bubbles. There's a picture in the paper of a bunch of bubbles around that incision point during the bloat and float because the gas could escape through that incision and they still continued to float for a long period of time. There's a quote about this, which is a little bit graphic. Again, it's that quote, Floating carcasses did not start to sink immediately after gases started to escape via the mouth, cloaca, and right hind limb surgical wound, or even after larval insects penetrated the intestinal and stomach walls during the active decay and advanced decay stages, end quote. Oh, my goodness. So, yes, there were lots of larvae from flying insects that moved in and started eating the crocodile corpse, as you would expect. Mm -hmm. Everybody's sort of familiar with what flies do. But I found that really interesting that even once the abdomen was opened up and the intestines and the stomach, there still was enough gas and like bloat material to keep it floating. So it's not like it's just a gas in a balloon again and not a gas in a balloon, even in an organ. It's like the tissue itself is bloated and puffed up enough that that's what's keeping it floating. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. So in all, the crocodiles stayed floating for three to six weeks before they finally sank, which is way longer than I expected. On average, they spent 32 days bloat and floating, (laughs) which is, you know, (laughs) essentially a month. They were floating for an entire month. And by the time they sank, they had gone through, as they said, advanced decay stages, the early parts of that, which is essentially like It's quite rotten at that point. Like most of the skin is like open. You can see lots of bones, like the muscle is getting all eaten up and everything. So it's well, well advanced decay at this point when it finally does sink. So since they grouped these either buried initially, buried after the bloat and float or not buried at all, period, they compared how much the bones were articulated at the end of the process on a scale of zero to four. So no articulation is zero and a four is fully articulated like a perfect dinosaur, like you'd expect for the ones that were buried before they moved at all. Mm -hmm. The buried crocodile that did stay buried the entire time, in fact, was all fours across the board. It didn't move as you'd expect. It's buried. There weren't any other animals around it to dig it up or mess with it at all. So that makes sense. It's basically akin to a mudslide or some of the floods that bury a dinosaur when they're fully intact. And you expect that you might be able to find all the bones articulated in place. For those that weren't buried at all, so they floated and then they just sank down whenever and then they didn't get buried afterwards. The heads of the animals scored perfect fours on two out of three of the individuals, which is pretty good considering they weren't buried at all. But I guess crocodile skulls are pretty fused and fairly heavy, so maybe it's not too surprising they didn't separate too much. The vertebrae scored twos on average, which was the best in the back vertebrae. Then the neck was the next best and the worst in the tail, which makes sense. They're the smallest vertebrae and they're also kind of off on the end. Mm -hmm. The limbs were mostly ones and zeros, so they got pretty well scattered. And the ribs were zeros across the board. And that actually included the ones that got buried after bloating and floating and then huh. sinking yeah the ribs because they're not connected to anything and oh. it's basically whether or not they're articulated with the vertebrae and when something sinks like they just get screwed up mm-hmm. 
And again, this is with basically zero water movement. <laughs> they did replace the water in a few of the samples so that they could see through the gunk and take good pictures and see how the experiment was progressing. Mm -hmm. That's why it was useful to have eight individuals because then they could leave some completely undisturbed and other ones they could change out the water a little bit. They literally scooped it out. They were like, we were going to filter it, but there was another experiment where they ran a filter and the filter got all clogged with scales and gunk. <laughs> so we decided we would do it. I was like, oh, I cannot imagine running this experiment with all the flies and there was like tons of mosquito larvae Mostly and the stuff. smells for me. Oh, boy, it's not exciting. And it was a, it was warm, too, because this was in Australia. I'm not into the taphonomy. We've heard paleontologists say they like paleontology because everything is so sterile because mm -hmm. it's been dead for so long and it's fossilized. It's just rocks. It's clean. But then there are people that are like taphonomy. That's what I want to do, which is the grossest <laughs> thing. Also paleontology, though. So even with zero water movement, essentially, and zero large scavengers, it's just a larvae and bacteria, although technically, apparently, bacteria are sometimes called decomposers and not scavengers. I don't know what that's about. The fact that they disarticulated so much seems crazy to me because we find articulated fossils underwater all the time. And it just sort of shows how perfect those conditions are for those animals. They must have gotten buried very fast. And in most cases before bloat and floating. But for some of the ankylosaurs, we think they did bloat and float and they still ended up coming out in pretty good shape. So maybe it's that their bodies were bigger and maybe they sank a little bit earlier or something. I don't know. But it's really interesting how much just bloating and floating. And they didn't float that high. It was like, I think they said 20 centimeters or something. Like it's not a very deep fish tank. It's not like they're floating through an ocean or a river or something. Mm -hmm. It's barely going up and down in a still tank and they still get scattered quite a bit. So yeah, the notion that bones get scattered because they get washed down a stream or something like that, completely unnecessary. They get scattered just by floating up and then sinking back down. I also find it interesting because crocodiles aren't particularly buoyant. They eat gastroliths, they don't have hollow bones, and they have small, if any, air sacs. And those adaptations are helpful because they actually like sinking and spending a lot of the time on the bottom of lakes and rivers. That way they can surprise their prey. Yeah, exactly. And they, you know, it's just how they do, which is completely unlike dinosaurs, which a lot of them had really big air sacs. They tended to have a lot of pneumaticity in their bones. They were really lightweight by comparison. Which makes me think they could have really bloated and floated for quite a while, probably well outdoing these crocodiles one month mark. But unfortunately, we don't know much about dinosaur anatomy. I think we could argue that dinosaurs were at least as buoyant as modern crocodiles, although heavily armored ankylosaurs could be the exception. But crocodiles were also covered in osteoderms. And ankylosaurs also had a much larger body mass, which would have more bloating potential, <laughs> which could be how they bloated and floated successfully, I guess. <laughs> I would guess that ankylosaurs could have easily floated a similar amount of time if undisturbed. But again, this is an experiment where they're in a tank and nothing's ripping at them. Right. It, it's possible that if there were birds landing on them and tearing out pieces or something, maybe they wouldn't bloat and float as long. Or sharks coming along and taking chunks out of them. Mm -hmm. Another interesting aspect of the study is just like ankylosaurs, the crocodiles flipped over onto their backs during the bloat and float process. Mm. Like a fish. Yeah, apparently, actually, now that you mention that, the term belly up, according to Merriam-Webster, is, quote, from the floating position of a dead fish, end quote. Mm. I didn't realize that was where belly up came from. But yes, even fish do flip over when they bloat. But crocodiles, in this case, were in more or less a typical theropod death pose while they were floating. So their head and tail are sort of curved backwards as they were sinking in the water. Their head and tail sinks into the water and then their sort of abdomen is the part that's floating the most, which is sort of interesting. It makes me wonder if any of those death pose dinosaurs is related to bloating and floating. Hmm, that's a good point. But the ankylosaurs I always thought flipped because they had that heavy back armor, but it probably actually has more to do with where the gases were building up because the guts of basically all vertebrates are on the bottom or on the belly side, and then the vertebrae and muscles on the top or on the back wouldn't decompose as quickly and don't bloat up as much. So it's likely that all dinosaurs, which bloated and floated, would float belly up just like these crocodiles or fish or anything like that. It's interesting to think about. I feel like all cartoons show something belly up. Oh, yeah. And they're in water and they're supposed to be dead. 
<laughs> I guess so. I don't. I can't think of those cartoons. But it's it's one of those examples of a taphonomy experiment that really tells us a lot about the fossilization process, which we can't witness. You know, you just put a bunch of crocodiles in tanks and see what happens, mm-hmm. and then you see it like, oh, that that's exactly what we were guessing was happening with the ankylosaurs, and then just seeing how much the bones get scattered and all that. They're really interesting studies. I'm really glad we didn't have to do it, though, or smell it or <laughs> see it in detail. Somebody else did it, and then they can share how they did it, Yeah, what they found. Even some of the pictures in this article were just too much for me. I'm a big, I'm a softy. <laughs> <laughs> like the bones. <laughs> and on that lovely note, that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. If you want to help us get to our next milestone, then join us on Patreon, patreon.com slash Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.